basically her point is like, we've got love all wrong. Love is not this like, you know, flowers and chocolate and, you know, lingerie thing. Love is any time you're with another human and you're just having a trusting, biologically resonant moment, right? Where you're exchanging goodwill and understanding and benevolence. Like, Mm -hmm. that is a moment of love. And it doesn't mean as much as we like to think it means to have those moments of love. It can, but it— It can. Yes. Absolutely. And I think her argument is, like, in a similar similar way that I like to say that we're indefatigable in terms of compassion, I think her claim is that— We also have an unlimited capacity for an opportunity to experience love. Like we could experience love all day long with the range of different people that we interact with just by not assuming when we encounter someone that somehow they're a threat or, you know, they're somebody we need to compete with or defend ourselves against. And we have so many opportunities to interact with each other in ways that can leave us with the benefits of an experience of love that we don't necessarily. Social support, I believe you said before. What if you have social anxiety? What if you have trouble making friends? You know, what if you're listening to this and you're thinking, wow, I don't don't actually have that many close friends. What do you do about that? Yeah, well, it's not a quantity thing. It's a quality thing. And I get this question a lot, but framed a little bit differently, which is what if you're an introvert and how do introverts do this? And isn't it unfairly easier for extroverts? Well, extroverts tend to score higher in happiness on average. That's just what we see. They tend to look back and consider their life as something that they've put on a higher number when you ask, you know, one to seven, how happy are you? And then the good part of the story for introverts is that when they do stuff that we know is good for happiness, it has a bigger effect on them (laughs) than it does for extroverts. So, for example, random acts of kindness, right? Great. It's a bumper sticker all over Berkeley. But it's also really a scientifically demonstrated, impactful happiness practice. You can just decide, hey, for the next 10 days, I'm going to open that door for the person who I see who's carrying two bags. I'm going to say thank you in a more specific and um, kind of extended way to my spouse. I'm going to offer help to somebody who I see who looks like they need it. Whatever it is, little things, little random acts of kindness. I'm going to tell a joke to a colleague. It can be pretty simple. It increases happiness. But it's a lot harder for an introvert to go out and do that Mm -hmm. in the world, especially the socially interactive ones. But once again, when they do them, they get more out of it than the extroverts do. So, yeah, being socially anxious, your road is a little bit harder, but you get more out of doing it. The other uh, term or phrase that often comes up in this kind of conversation is the whole fake it till you make it. Yes. Can you fake it till you make it? Can you go out there and just say stuff? No, not if you don't mean it. Not if you don't really want to. No, Nobody's going to force a person to be happier. If you want to and it's hard and it puts you a little bit out of your comfort zone, yeah, then it totally works. Then it's really helpful. I say go for it. More often than not, it's going to help and uh, lead to a bigger upswing of happiness than it would for somebody who already kind of does this stuff. Yeah, I do. Well, when I talk about stress and resilience, it's one of the opportunities for me to really showcase compassion because what I think happens with stress is that one of the paths is, and this is one of my plus signs, is stress plus, and then there's a circle, and inside that circle it says rumination, self-criticism, and stoicism. So these are ways that we relate to our own anxiety or stress or feeling that we don't have the resources to handle whatever challenges we're facing. And when we relate to that experience, again, by thinking about it a lot and worrying about what the implications are or by just coming down on ourselves in a harsh way and saying we're never going to amount to anything, everybody hates us, we're always going to be hated by everyone, or we're just like, forget it, I'm not going to feel anything. I'm just going to hold this down because I'm fine. Everything's fine, right? Just uh, stifle it all. That way of being really is like the secret to chronic stress because that just like extends it out, keeps it in there, and keeps it going. And I don't have to go into the um, consequences, negative consequences of chronic stress, 